Right, good evening everyone and um, welcome to the first in our Bentham Seminars for this um, session. Uh, it's nice to see so many people turning out at this irregular time. Um, but then again, we have our irregular speaker, um, Professor David Lieberman from the School of Law at the um, University of California at Berkeley. Um, David, um, I'm sure he doesn't need um, any introduction, so I'm not going to give him one. As I have to say, it's, it's always great to um, listen to, to David, and he's one of our very best um, Bentham scholars. And so uh, I'm sure we're in for an, um, a real treat this evening. So, David, um, please um, tell us what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm always uh, pleased and nervous to talk about Bentham uh, at Bentham House and before the experts. As will be uh, painfully obvious very early on, uh, I'm presenting work at an early stage of preparation. Uh, for reasons of vanity, I would be delighted to be instead presenting a very polished uh, final piece of work. Uh, but at the same time, I looked forward and wanted to take advantage of the opportunity to try something out at an early stage to get uh, comments and responses. Uh, so that's the kind of paper I'm presenting. Uh, I will do nothing by way of making it easy. I don't have handouts. I don't have PowerPoint. Uh, I'll just be working through uh, a set of themes and issues that I've been thinking about recently. Uh, this paper connects with some other uh, papers I've recently done which take as an object of attention the question of the way in which uh, Bentham's theory of law, legislative science, legislative program was altered under the impact of his democratic radicalism. As will be well known to many people here, uh, Bentham at the first stage of his career develops a plan for a comprehensive system of legislation he refers to as the Pannonian. Uh, much later in his career, uh, he becomes converted or embraces democratic politics by 1809, some several decades after the legislative theory is in place. He becomes a Democrat. He doesn't publicly reveal his democratic convictions till his intervention in 1817 in parliamentary debates. The last phase of his career, the period, decade and a half, up before his death in 1832, he of course spends a great deal of his attention developing a program for a representative democratic state. Uh, the state involves an elected legislature, which uh, based on virtual universal franchise, some limitations, annual elections, secret ballots, an elaborate administrative machinery for government, uh, which is to uh, advance the greatest happiness in part by eliminating the remnants of aristocracy and monarchy, sinister interests from the political system. The question I'm trying to think through in this paper uh, is the manner in which Bentham's early jurisprudence doesn't simply ignore democracy, doesn't simply operate prior to his conversion to democratic politics, but also creates uh, involves a set of positions which are self-consciously anti-radical. Uh, in the words of my countrymen, Bentham comes to democracy with a certain amount of baggage, a certain amount of anti-radical commitments. These commitments are foundational, central to his jurisprudence. They are controversial at the point at which he articulates them they remain controversial uh, uh, in the process of the reception of Benthamic utilitarianism. 
And although they are central and important to the legal theory and the system of legislation, I want to suggest that in his politics, in his democratic program, there is a surprising amount of accommodation to certain elements, certain institutions in the standard radical agenda. What the jurisprudence repudiates at certain levels, the politics manages selectively to adapt and to incorporate. To make things somewhat more concrete, I'll be dealing with two features of Bentham's thought. First, the critique of natural rights and rights of man theory and attendant with that, a position opposed to the entrenchment of constitutional rights in uh, 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 the legal system. And second, I'll be looking at Bentham's attitude to juries, particularly the, co the traditional common law jury, and in both cases, I want to suggest at first blush, it looks like Bentham is simply repudiating certain doctrines, rejecting them famously. But then there's a way in which some elements of these positions seep into the democratic politics. One way to think about this is that Bentham, as a political radical, often in his concrete political program adopts positions that are already part of a kind of English radical agenda. This is perhaps most prominent in the case of parliamentary reform, where his arguments for annual elections, the secret ballot, wider franchise, rehearse positions that early radicals had presented and developed decades before. So there are points at which there's a coincident between the concrete program and earlier positions in English radicalism. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, there is Bentham seeking to connect with radical groups in the period after 1817, radical groups certainly in England, but also Ireland, Greece, Iberia, South America, often the radicals with whom he's collaborating do not embrace the full panoply of Bentham's legislative theory or particularly his moral theory, but Bentham opportunistically seeks to make common cause with a larger radical movement, uh, certainly one in England and beyond England. So I'm trying to add another layer to how we think about Bentham's relationship to English radicalism. A heroic version of this paper, a heroic version of this approach would give a summary synthetic uh, uh, account of English radicalism and how to fit Bentham in that context. I'm not going to be heroic. I'm not going to try and kind of give you uh, a definitive synthesis of what we mean by English radicalism, but instead I'm going to focus on two elements, doctrines of the rights of man attitudes to the common law jury, which are fundamental, critical to a great deal of radical position. Okay. So I'm going to begin and spend more time on the rights of man, Bentham and the rights of man. Those of you worried about the clock, this will take a bit longer than the jury part, so you needn't panic, or you'll have good reason to panic, but not that the jury part is going to take as long as the rights of man, uh, and uh, 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 we'll see how we do. Okay. The doctrine of the rights of man, of course, received its classic formulation in the French revolutionary st statement of the Declaration of the Rights of Man. In terms of English radicalism, I think it is Paine's defense of the French Revolution uh, against the critique of Edmund Burke uh, in the early 1790s, which becomes a definitive account of the rights of man for English Jacobinism for one strand of English radicalism. Bentham's own engagement with 
natural rights theories, approach to politics based on individual rights came a good deal earlier in the context of American independence. And as some of you will know, this biographical story, uh, Bentham has uh, an elder friend, John Lind. John Lind is tasked by the administration of Lord North to produce a response to the American's Declaration of Independence. Uh, Bentham collaborates with Lind on that response, which is indeed published. And in the context of this response, develops his own understanding of the nature of liberty, how liberty is to be understood as a legal phenomenon, which is developed to counter the Lockean position of the American Declaration of Independence, which presumes or proceeds on the basis that individuals before politics enjoy rights, natural rights, and during situations of systemic political abuse are authorized to mobilize these natural rights against existing structures of law and political authority. And the American colonists, in claiming independence, are exercising this Lockean political moment, withdrawing their allegiance from the British crown, asserting their natural rights to create a new political order. Bentham, to counter this approach, develops a famous alternative understanding of liberty. Liberty and rights are a product and a component of security. Where such security exists, it exists because of human law. Human law does its work in creating and protecting law rights, rather, by imposing obligations and burdens on people. Liberty exists because of restrictions that the law imposes on conduct in general, which it confirms and secures through the threats of punishment to assert pre-legal rights, natural rights against law and government is to misunderstand the nature of rights and the nature of liberty. The rights and liberty exist because of law. They are products of human law rather than something that is mobilized to create human law. Uh, the working out of this theory of liberty and rights in some ways was the product of contingent circumstances, the collaboration with Lynn, the Lynn assignment to respond to the declaration. But Bentham emphasizes at the time that this counter theory of liberty is a cornerstone to his projected system of jurisprudence and law reform. And true to his word, this account of liberty and legal rights appears in the far more significant publication for Bentham of 1776, The Fragment on Government. Uh, and of course, The Fragment on Government becomes a central work in the Bentham canon, republished uh, in the 1820s during the period of political radicalism. The fragment on government is derived from a larger, uncompleted parent work, a critique of Blackstone's uh, account of English law, the comment on the commentaries. Most of the comment on the commentaries deals with Blackstone's conservatism, what Bentham calls his antipathy to, reform to reformation, his apologetics for the existing system of English law. But Blackstone likewise had uh, introduced English law through a discussion of natural rights, social contract as the foundation of the political order, and this gives Bentham the opportunity to rehearse the arguments against natural rights, against social contract theory, which he had first worked out uh, in the context of the response to the Declaration of Independence. So it's there early on. In addition, the larger comment on the commentary provides Bentham with an occasion to reject and critique another way in which 
uh, English commentators, including radicals, talked about English liberties, which was less through an appeal to nature and to reason, natural rights, rational rights, but instead to think historically about English rights as part of an ancient and historical uh, foundation of English government, a system of Anglo-Saxon liberty that had been preserved throughout English history through various forms of threats and which formed the basis of English legal rights. Bentham in the comment and elsewhere has as little patience with thinking about liberty and law in historical terms as he does in terms of the approach of the rights of man theory. Uh, uh, and the comment on the commentary provides an occasion in the mid-1770s for him to think through why uh, uh, that account, that approach to law, is inadequate. The most famous Bentham discussion of these issues is, of course, Nonsense on Stilts, the critique of the French Declaration, which he begins to compose in uh, 1792, Bentham, interestingly, did not participate in a debate which uh, uh, forms around Burke's reflections on the revolution, in which Paine's rights of man is a particular celebrated contribution. There's a long, very fierce debate in England about how to think about the French Revolution in the first part that's occurring right immediately in the period, I guess, 1789 to 91, and then has a much longer legacy within English political debate. Bentham only enters the critique of the French Revolutionary document at the point at which the French Revolution is becoming more violent and extreme, and it's a production of a context of Bentham's increasing uh, uh, anxiety, nervousness, and anger about the dangers the French Revolution has unleashed. And of course, often in the teaching of rights theory, I'm thinking now about the contemporary teaching of political theory, Bentham, Marx, Burke are kind of yoked as this unlikely trio as three great critics of rights theory, all of whom turn their attention to this famous uh, French revolutionary document. I'm not going to go through the detail of Fred, uh, Bentham's uh, critique of the French uh, Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen in Nonsense Upon Stilts. The basic structure of the argument is the same he rehearsed, I think, against the Americans about the confusions and falsehoods of thinking about pre-legal rights, not recognizing the extent to which rights exist as a product of human law, the way in which the rights of man have confused a foundational relationship concerning the nature of freedom in organized uh, human society. What's, of course, uh, uh, novel or, or emphasized in a novel way in the context of the French Revolution is Bentham's insistence on the anarchic implication of this theory of law, the way he sees the extremism and violence of the French Revolution as the causal res res result of the wrong way of thinking about the state and politics. And so this preoccupation with the anarchic uh, uh, legacy of the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen. Also, what's novel is the kind of line-by-line -line critique that he offers, the emphasis on uh, the, the errant terminology, the way in which the words aren't used in a disciplined, consistent way. But what I think is also really important in the Bentham legislative program and which is uh, emphasized with particular force is the understanding of the rights of man as in a way an inherently anti-legal position. That insistence on the rights of man, the reason for articulating this kind of theory of law is to constrain and to limit legislative capacity and it's that menace, thinking about what you need to do to limit all the benefits you can get from law that Bentham's particularly emphasizing. I think it's an extension of that logic which leads him in his constitutional designs to be so hostile to entrenching constitutional positions. There are many features of the state he wants to secure as a Democrat as we'll see, freedom of the press, freedom of the religion, and the like. 
but he does not think the way you will best protect these uh, uh, areas of human life is by creating constitutional hurdles, supermajoritarian requirements, hierarchies of law, which will make it hard to amend, to alter, and to change. Okay. So, the punchline, what you all knew, familiar, is Bentham doesn't like natural rights theory. Doesn't like it from an early stage, really doesn't like it in 1792, but it remains a consistent part of his view about law, how to understand law, how to understand legislative capacity. In later writings, uh, Bentham distinguishes what he calls the errant logic of documents like the American Declaration of Independence from what he understands as the political use of such documents. It's kind of a fuzzy distinction. But he recognizes that there's a value in statements like at least the Declaration of Independence. He also cites in this context the English Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Rights that's adopted as part of the Glorious Revolution, 1688-89. And what's value about, valuable about such documents is that they provide a template, a standard, a public statement of expectations in terms of which political conduct can be judged and oriented. Terrible way of thinking about law, valuable as aspirational statements about how the community should organize itself, what it should expect from its government. He thinks these documents, these historic statements about rights or other features of political life, Magna Carta and other settings as an example he gives, have done important historical work, not because they've been honored, not because they've obeyed, but because they've created these publicly articulated standards. Key here is a really critical feature of Bentham's democratic theory, his political theory, which is the power of critical public opinion as a way of sanctioning and disciplining public power. In his democratic design, in addition to all the things about elections and the franchise, Bentham has an elaborate program for the mobilization of critical public opinion. He institutionalizes it in terms of a fictitious entity he calls the Public Opinion Tribunal, enforcing its criticism and censure of abusive politics through the moral sanction. And he claims that of all the devices for preventing the abuse of government, political corruption, it is this public opinion tribunal and the moral sanction, which is the ultimate resource of a democratic community against political abuse. And to a surprising extent, given the jurisprudence, I want to suggest uh, he's willing to think about public declarations, public statements, as part of this equipment of critical public opinion. And here I want to very briefly invoke two works. Uh, one is the 1822 composition addressed to the Tripoli <laughs> Securities Against Misrule. And the second is the Legislator's Declaration that appears in the first volume, the 1830 volume of the Constitutional Code. For my purposes here, the Securities Against Misrule, though it's an exotic composition in many ways, is the more interesting and the more valuable. I'm not going to run through the context and Bentham's goals, which are complex. But he is thinking, he's addressing uh, uh, the question of political reform in Tripoli, which is an autocratic state. He's assuming that Tripoli will remain an autocratic state. And in many ways, he's trying to investigate, explore, how much could you achieve 
in legal and political reform simply through the mechanism of public opinion since the apparatus of democratic government is going to be absent. There's a great deal about introducing a political press into Tripoli. Uh, uh, I was going to say other fanciful proposals, whether they're fanciful enough, I don't want to get into. But amongst the recommendations for Tripoli is that the Pasha, the ruling autocrat, issue a statement of security's immense misrule, a statement of protections he will grant to the individual members of the Tripolian, Tripolitan, what should be the adjective, of the community in question. These securities against misrule, he also describes explicitly as an acknowledgement of rights, the rights of the members of the community. And in a way, it is the Benth Benthamic version of the Declaration of the Rights of the Citizen. It's jurisprudentially cleansed according to the way Bentham understands law and legislation. Bentham talks about securities, not rights. He thinks that's clearer and more accurate, more precise. He makes it clear in the way the document is formulated that these securities are a product of law, a product of what government has done. They are not declaring anything that preexisted in nature or before government. Nonetheless, and I've done this and I won't go through it now, you can compare his list of acknowledged rights with other documents like the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, like the documents that the states in the United States adopt uh, in the 70, late 1770s after independence as part of their constitutional, and see what, you know, what, what, what's the canon? What's the list of rights in question? And in many ways, what we might expect, what we now think of as basic liberal rights are there. Freedom of religion, uh, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly. Given Bentham's concern with public opinion and the power of public opinion to censure and regulate political life, there's tremendous emphasis on freedom of the press and what he later calls freedom of public discussion. It's not simply that there will be a press and the absence of censorship. He's also very concerned with other ways censorship works. So their provisions about people's papers won't be seized, no false or mysterious imprisonment, no mysterious banishment, and the like. Often in thinking about these protections to the individuals, Bentham is quite ready to associate the liberties in question with specific and familiar features of English law. Habeas corpus, in the case of false imprisonment, the coroner's inquest in English law as a procedure for dealing with mysterious death and the like. There's, if you like, a, a readiness to draw on the existing uh, 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 institutional structure that he finds and takes advantage of it and takes advantage. I find also a striking kind of Anglo orientation beyond this to his list of rights. I think this is clearest in uh, the right to bear arms or the right for the citizens to be armed in the case of Tripoli. That is not a right that appears in the French or most continental documents. There's a way in which this is a right that appears most often in Anglophone settings. Certainly, as people know, in the case of the United States, it becomes a constitutionally entrenched right, first in the state constitutions, later in the federal constitution, with famously disastrous uh, results. Uh, but in addition to that, the right to bear arms uh, appears in English documents like the Declaration of Rights associated with the Glorious Revolution, which there's often appeals to certain medieval precedents for it. So I'm, I'm struck by this kind of Anglo equality. Maybe, and others will tell me, it's a secret strategy because part of what Bentham also is interested in Tripoli is uh, a potential revolution against the existing government. So getting these people armed will be valuable for his uh, 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 unexpressed campaign. 
But nonetheless, there is this list of rights. I think in many ways, it's uh, I see Securities Against this Rule as a kind of exotic document generated by very special circumstances. The benthamic acknowledgement of rights does not appear in the constitutional code. It's a kind of area of attention. But instead, what one finds in the constitutional code is this legislator's declaration, a statement of principles uh, that is meant to be pledged, declared in the context of electoral, uh, uh, con electoral contest. Uh, uh, everyone's meant to declare uh, an adherence to these set of principles. It is not oriented towards rights, rather it is oriented towards the elimination of those practices which Bentham associates with sinister interests, no secrecy, no mendacity, and the like. There's a certain amount of due process in terms of the operations of law, so it's different. But what I'm struck by is this seizing on a certain kind of public declaration by those in power or those attempting to gain power as to how they will conduct themselves. And in other radical writings, Bentham invokes the example of the 1688 Declaration, even talks about Magna Carta as valuable parts of the, if you like, equipment that can be mobilized against the abuse of power. The legal theory in a way repudiates much of the logic of the tradition of declaring rights. But the mature political theory salvages, cleanses, adapts part of what Bentham finds valuable. Declarations of public standards in terms of which public opinion can be focused, in terms of which the mobile sanction, sorry, the moral sanction can be mobilized. I'm now going to turn to the jury. Again, it will be briefer, but it's the same logic that I believe is at work, or the same situation. In the jurisprudence, there's a rejection of the common law jury. At the same time, there's a kind of selective adaptation and incorporation of the jury for the purposes of a democratic polity. And in certain works, in certain settings, Bentham finds it very convenient to rehearse standard traditional English radical arguments about the jury uh, uh, for the purposes of criticizing current abuses. So that's where I'm going. Let me just briefly say that uh, the jury, of course, is a headline institution in any account of English liberty, be it a conservative uh, political uh, uh, commentators or radical political commentators. There's a convention that uh, the jury is that part of the liberty, as Jean-Louis Delhomme expresses it, to which the English are most wedded. Uh, the Blackstonian rhetoric about the palladium of English liberty. English liberty will survive, unlike Carthage, unlike Rome, unlike Athens, and so on, because England has trial by jury. It is a headline, paradigmatic institution to invoke in an account of the nature of English liberty. English radicals tend to give the jury a kind of populist democratic twist. The fact that no one is convicted, or in this part of the legal order, conviction does not occur until unless 12 unanimous uh, lay people agree to the guilt of the accused is seen a way of bringing either democratic, as it will later be called, or popular uh, participation into the legal order. And the jury is often light associated with the elected House of Commons as the two features of English law and politics that provide counterweights, necessary and valuable counterweights, to aristocracy and monarchy in the English system. Okay. In his jurisprudence, 
Bentham, I think, when I say I think, that's code. I'm worried what Philip will correct what I think. But okay. I think Bentham, by and large, in the end, is against juries. The part of the jurisprudence in question is the procedure code, the part of the code, the larger panomian that's devoted to the actual adjudication of disputes under the law. Here, Bentham recommends what he calls the natural procedure or natural method of adjudicating disputes, which gives an individual judge wide powers to collect evidence, to interrogate witnesses, to assemble information about the dispute, and to determine the outcome, to determine guilt or innocence or the reconciliation of the dispute in civil cases. Correct decision will occur. The disciplining of the judge against potential views will occur in part because of the nature of the code, the publicly explained comprehensive code, but it will also occur through processes of publicity and accountability which discipline political power in general in the democratic setting. Within such a structure, what we might think of as ideal circumstances, there is no need for a jury and certainly no need for a jury, a lay group, to decide questions of guilt or innocence, guilt and innocence. Such um, uh, an institution is redundant, it adds expense, vexation, delay, adds burdens, and it can be discarded. In substantive terms, what Bentham says that in the case of civil disputes, juries need not participate at all except for cases that are appealed, and he anticipates that these cases will be relatively rare under the ideal circumstances of the code of the larger code. In criminal cases, juries can be restricted to cases that involve public power, treason, sedition, crimes against finance, against the uh, apparatus of government finance, and in situations where he anticipates a large gap of sympathy between the judge and the accused. So crimes of indigence, like petty theft. Here he thinks, I think I read him that a jury might be useful, though even there I think there's a little bit of ambiguity about what kind of jury he has. So I read the position as anti-jury, particularly anti the traditional common law jury, an institution that will determine legal outcomes. But at the same time, Bentham finds a way of accommodating what he thinks is truly valuable about the jury and offers an important role for what I see as a radical reimagination of the jury, an institution he calls the quasi-jury. Uh, he equivocates over whether he should have called it a jury all, at all, and I think that reflects the way in which it really is quite different from a traditional jury. One is in terms of its function. It doesn't decide cases, but what it does is it serves as an observer of the court, of the legal process, of the judge, and it is part of the way in which publicity, accountability, moral sanction is mobilized in the context of judicial procedure. And in the Constitutional Code, Bentham refers to it as a subcommittee of the public opinion tribunal. It's composed of three persons rather than 12. It operates by majority rule rather than unanimity. It does not decide any outcomes, but it does give judgments. It gives its opinion of how the case should be settled and why. And in cases, situations of disagreement, it exposes what the judge has done to wider scrutiny and also provides a grounds for appeal. 
juries or this quasi-jury, again, I want to suggest, is a kind of jurisprudentially cleansed way that Bentham incorporates an element of a more traditional institutional order, kind of incorporates a feature of the English legal order that had become quite central to radical critiques of the system of law, particularly the way the law was operated during the period of the French Revolutionary Wars, where there was lavish censorship and persecution of radical agitation. And the proof of this, I think, comes in a series of polemics, Bentham writes, against the abuse of the legal order during the 1810s and 1820s. And I won't be spend a long time on this, but I think a, a classic kind of polemic I have in mind is the work called Elements of the Art of Packing. Uh, it's published or printed rather in 1821. It's written over a decade earlier. It, deal, it deals with a very technical piece of English law in operation in Middlesex and London, these so-called special juries and how they're appointed. But for Bentham, the important thing he's examining there is the law of seditious libel and the liberty of the press. He's worried the way in which the special juries are being manipulated so that they don't perform the function which he sees as valuable not in the ideal circumstances of the Pannonian and democracy, but in the existing system of political corruption and sinister interest. And in that existing system, juries do important work in blocking the implementation of abusive law. For Bentham, freedom of the press does not exist as a matter of law. The law in question actually sanctions large amounts of censorship. Liberty of the press in England exists because of the blocking and frustration of the existing law, and juries do important work in helping that prevented blocking of the law, that obstruction of the law. Typical Bentham way, it goes on at great length. <laughs> Element to the arts of packing, I'll spare you. But what I'm struck by is how in this setting, and in some ways I'm running this parallel to Sirius against misrule, Bentham has a setting in where he can rehearse a lot of standard radical critiques of the legal order. He can become a great defender of the common law jury because he sees it's being abused and it's operating in a situation where its work is really important work in preserving the liberty of the press. And so you get a lot of this language which you find in more typical, in other settings where the value of the jury to the system of English liberty, the abuse of the jury as having undermined the constitution, the th use of famous examples where uh, royal government and especially threats of Stuart absolutism aimed at the destruction of the jury, the famous radical prosecutions of the 1810s, Cobbett and company being censored. And it's Bentham, so it's iconoclastic and strange, and the language is weird. But in a funny way, he's got a setting where he can embrace a good deal of standard uh, 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 radical elements. Uh, I'm always struck that in this work, he talks about uh, the dangers to the Constitution, the risk that the Constitution is at an end, and roughly at the same time in the context of the plan of parliamentary reform, he announces he's going to leave all the conventions about the balanced Constitution, the mixed Constitution, the wisdom of the Constitution to Mother Goose and Mother Blackstone. Here he finds a setting in which uh, talking about the constitutional order, historical English liberties uh, uh, is convenient and so on. I don't think, I don't at all want to suggest this is a case of hypocrisy, about inconsistency, about failure of forthrightness. Rather, what I'm trying to suggest is there are settings 
in which Bentham's attempt to advance radical cause, uh, to take in opportunistic advantage of certain situations, be it Tripoli, be it elsewhere, uh, uh, be it England and the preservation of freedom of the press, that adopting the language, adopting the devices, adopting the institutional structures of more traditional radical thinkers proves attractive and he finds a way to do it. I'm hoping the structure of the argument the general came here is clear. It seems to me one could run this analysis in other settings. An obvious one is the Bentham critique of colonies and empire, where again there's an established radical critique that had been developed since the mid at least the 1770s, where I think he's finding a way or finds a way to join hands in common cause with an older technique, but I, I don't want to point to more examples. Instead, I want to point to something that um, I'm less confident about, more tentative about, but is in a way the, more, uh, the larger theme that I'm trying to work through. Bentham, in his democratic theory, occupies a very radical position. And that's easiest to see in terms of the franchise, the secret ballot, the virtual universality of the vote. But to my mind, there's a way that when Bentham becomes a Democrat, he also, on certain dimensions, becomes a more traditional thinker, less iconoclastic than in some of his early jurisprudence. Now the state really matters to the way in which he thinks about advancing the greatest happiness, the greatest number. The abuse of political power becomes the center obstacle to establishing a legal order will advance the greatest happiness, the greatest number. And in a way, politics, the traditional conventional idea that the Politics is the central object of attention for someone who's aiming at this level of systematic reform emerges as the great object of attention in his constitutional thought and its role in the panomian. So on a certain dimension, Bentham the political radical seems to me more traditional in orientation it's politics and the state, which we need to think about centrally and which hadn't been thought about centrally. And perhaps, if that's the case, it's less surprising that in his political program, he finds it easier to accommodate and adjust to ways of thinking that in his jurisprudence and legislative program, he had been so critical of so impatient of, and so ready to repudiate.